The Secret of the Rosary for Renewal and Salvation by St. Louis de Montfort A White Rose Dear Ministers of the Most High God, You, my fellow priests, who preach the truth of God and who teach the gospel to all nations, let me give you this little book as a white rose that I would like you to keep. The truths contained in it are set forth in a very simple and straightforward manner, as you will see. Please keep them in your heart, so that you yourselves may make a practice of the rosary and taste its fruits. Please have them always on your lips, too, so that you will always preach the rosary and thus convert others by teaching them the excellence of this holy devotion. I beg of you to beware of thinking of the rosary as something of little importance, as do ignorant people, and even several great but proud scholars. Far from being insignificant, the rosary is a priceless treasure which is inspired by God. Almighty God has given it to you because he wants you to use it as a means to convert the most hardened sinners and the most obstinate heretics. He has attached to it grace in this life and glory in the next. The saints have said it faithfully and the popes have endorsed it. When the Holy Spirit has revealed this secret to a priest and director of souls, how blessed is that priest! For the vast majority of people fail to know this secret or else only know it superficially. If such a priest really understands this secret, he will say the rosary each day and will encourage others to say it. God and his blessed mother will pour abundant grace into his soul so that he may become God's instrument for his glory, and his word, though simple, will do more good in one month than that of other preachers in several years. Therefore, my dear brothers and fellow priests, it will not be enough for us to preach this devotion to others. We must practice it ourselves. For if we firmly believed in the importance of the Holy Rosary, but never said it ourselves, people could hardly be expected to act upon our advice, since no one can give what he does not have. Jesus began to do and to teach. We ought to pattern ourselves on our Lord, who began practicing what he preached. We ought to emulate St. Paul, who knew and preached nothing but Jesus crucified. I could tell you at great length of the grace God has given me to know by experience the effectiveness of the preaching of the Holy Rosary, and of how I have seen, with my own eyes, the most wonderful conversions it has brought about. I would gladly tell you all these things if I thought that it would move you to preach this beautiful devotion, in spite of the fact that priests are not in the habit of doing so these days. But instead of all this, I think it will be quite enough for this little summary that I am writing if I tell you a few ancient but authentic stories about the Holy Rosary. These excerpts really go to prove what I have outlined for the faithful. A Red Rose Poor men and women who are sinners, I, a greater sinner than you, wish to give you this rose, a crimson one, because the precious blood of our Lord has fallen upon it. Please God that it may bring true fragrance into your lives. But above all, may it save you from the danger that you are in. Every day unbelievers and unrepentant sinners cry, Let us crown ourselves with roses. But our cry should be, Let us crown ourselves with the roses of the Holy Rosary. How different are theirs from ours. Their roses are pleasures of the flesh, worldly honors and passing riches which wilt and decay in no time. But ours, which are the Our Father and Hail Mary, which we have said devoutly over and over again, and to which we have added good penitential acts, will never wilt or die, and they will be just as exquisite thousands of years from now as they are today. On the contrary, sinners' roses only look like roses, while in point of fact they are cruel thorns which prick them during life by giving them pangs of conscience. At their death they pierce them with bitter regret, and still worse, in eternity, they turn to burning shafts of anger and despair. But if our roses have thorns, they are the thorns of Jesus Christ, who changes them into roses. If our roses prick us, it is only for a short time, and only in order to cure the illness of sin and to save our souls. So by all means, we should eagerly crown ourselves with these roses from heaven, and recite the entire rosary every day, that is to say, three rosaries each of five decades, which are like three little wreaths or crowns of flowers. There are two reasons for doing this. First of all, to honor the three crowns of Jesus and Mary. Jesus' crown of grace at the time of his incarnation, his crown of thorns during his passion, and his crown of glory in heaven. And of course, the threefold crown which the Blessed Trinity gave Mary in heaven. 
Secondly, we should do this so that we ourselves may receive three crowns from Jesus and Mary. The first, a crown of merit during our lifetime. The second, a crown of peace at our death. And the third, a crown of glory in heaven. If you say the rosary faithfully until death, I do assure you that, in spite of the gravity of your sins, you shall receive a never-fading crown of glory. Even if you are on the brink of damnation, even if you have one foot in hell, even if you have sold your soul to the devil, as sorcerers do who practice black magic, and even if you are a heretic as obstinate as a devil, sooner or later you will be converted and will amend your life and save your soul if, and mark well what I say, if you say the rosary devoutly every day until death for the purpose of knowing the truth and obtaining contrition and pardon for your sins. In this book there are several stories of great sinners who were converted through the power of the rosary. Please read and meditate upon them. A Mystical Rose Tree Good and devout souls who walk in the light of the Holy Spirit, I do not think you will mind my giving you this little mystical rose tree which comes straight from heaven and which is to be planted in the garden of your soul. It cannot possibly harm the sweet-smelling flowers of your contemplations, for it is a heavenly tree and its scent is very pleasant. It will not in the least interfere with your carefully planned flower beds, for being itself all pure and well-ordered, it inclines all to order and purity. If it is carefully watered and properly attended to every day, it will grow to such a marvelous height and its branches will have such a wide span that, far from hindering your other devotions, it will maintain and perfect them. Of course, you understand what I mean, since you are spiritually minded. This mystical rose tree is Jesus and Mary in life, death, and eternity. Its green leaves are the joyful mysteries, the thorns the sorrowful ones, and the flowers the glorious mysteries of Jesus and Mary. The buds are the childhood of Jesus and Mary, and the open blooms show us both of them in their sufferings, and the full-blown roses symbolize Jesus and Mary in their triumph and glory. A rose delights us because of its beauty. So here we have Jesus and Mary in the joyful mysteries. Its thorns are sharp and they prick, which makes us think of them in the sorrowful mysteries. And last of all, its perfume is so sweet that everyone loves it, and this fragrance symbolizes their glorious mysteries. So please, do not scorn this beautiful and heavenly tree, but plant it with your own hands in the garden of your soul by making the resolution to say your rosary every day. By saying it daily and by doing good works, you will be tending your tree, watering it, hoeing the earth around it. Eventually you will see that this little seed which I have given you, and which seems so small now, will grow into a tree so great that the birds of heaven, that is, predestinate and contemplative souls, will dwell in it and make their nests there. Its shade will shelter them from the scorching heat of the sun, and its height will keep them safe from the wild beasts on the ground. And best of all, they will feed upon the tree's fruit, which is none other than our adorable Jesus, to whom be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. God alone. A rosebud. Dear little friends, this beautiful rosebud is for you. It is one of the beads of the rosary, and it may seem to you to be such a tiny thing. But if you only knew how precious this bead is, this wonderful bud will open out into a gorgeous rose if you say your Hail Mary really well. Of course, it would be too much to expect you to say the whole fifteen mysteries every day, but do say at least five mysteries and say them properly with love and devotion. This rosary will be your little wreath of roses, your crown for Jesus and Mary. Please pay attention to every word I have said and listen carefully to a true story that I want to tell you and that I would like you to remember. Two little girls who were sisters were saying the rosary very devoutly in front of their house. A beautiful lady suddenly appeared, walked towards the younger girl, who was only about six or seven, took her by the hand, and led her away. Her elder sister was very startled and looked for the little girl everywhere. At last, still not having found her, she went home weeping and told her parents that her sister had been kidnapped. For three whole days the poor father and mother sought the child without success. At the end of the third day they found her at the front door looking extremely happy and pleased. Naturally they asked her where on earth she had been 
and she told them that the lady to whom she had been saying the rosary had taken her to a lovely place where she had given her delicious things to eat. She said that the lady had also given her a baby boy to hold, that he was very beautiful, and that she had kissed him again and again. The father and mother, who had been converted to the Catholic faith only a short time before, sent at once for the Jesuit father who had instructed them for their reception into the church, and who had also taught them devotion to the rosary. They told him everything that had happened, and it was this priest himself who told me this story. It all took place in Paraguay. So, dear children, imitate these little girls and say your rosary every day as they always did. If you do this, you will earn the right to go to heaven to see Jesus and Mary. If it is not their wish that you should see them in this life, at any rate after you die, you will see them for all eternity. Amen. Therefore let all men, the learned and the ignorant, the just and the sinners, the great and the small, praise and honor Jesus and Mary night and day by saying the Holy Rosary. Greet Mary who has labored much among you. First Decade The surpassing merit of the rosary as seen in its origin and name. First Rose The rosary is made up of two things, mental prayer and vocal prayer. In the rosary, mental prayer is none other than meditation of the chief mysteries of the life, death, and glory of Jesus Christ and of His Blessed Mother. Vocal prayer consists in saying fifteen decades of the Hail Mary, each decade headed by an Our Father, while at the same time meditating on and contemplating the fifteen principal virtues which Jesus and Mary practiced in the fifteen mysteries of the rosary. In the first five decades, we must honor the five joyful mysteries and meditate on them. In the second five decades, the sorrowful mysteries. And in the third group of five, the glorious mysteries. So the rosary is a blessed blending of mental and vocal prayer by which we honor and learn to imitate the mysteries and the virtues of the life, death, passion, and glory of Jesus and Mary. Second Rose since the rosary is composed, principally and in substance, of the prayer of Christ and the angelic salutation, that is, the Our Father and the Hail Mary, it was without doubt the first prayer and the principal devotion of the faithful, and has been in use all through the centuries, from the time of the apostles and disciples down to the present. It was only in the year 1214, however, that the Church received the rosary in its present form and according to the method we use today. It was given to the Church by St. Dominic, who had received it from the Blessed Virgin as a means of converting the Albigensians and other sinners. I will tell you the story of how he received it, which is found in the very well-known book De Dignitati Salteri by Blessed Alan de la Roche. St. Dominic, seeing that the gravity of people's sins was hindering the conversion of the Albigensians, withdrew into a forest near Toulouse, where he prayed continuously for three days and three nights. During this time, he did nothing but weep and do harsh penances in order to appease the anger of God. He used his discipline so much that his body was lacerated, and finally he fell into a coma. At this point, Our Lady appeared to him, accompanied by three angels, and she said, Dear Dominic, do you know which weapon the Blessed Trinity wants to use to reform the world? Oh, my lady, answered St. Dominic, you know far better than I do, because next to your son Jesus Christ, you have always been the chief instrument of our salvation. Then Our Lady replied, I want you to know that, in this kind of warfare, the principal weapon has always been the angelic psalter, which is the foundation stone of the New Testament. Therefore, if you want to reach these hardened souls and win them over to God, preach my psalter. So he arose, comforted, and burning with zeal for the conversion of the people in that district, he made straight for the cathedral. At once, unseen angels rang the bells to gather the people together, and St. Dominic began to preach. At the very beginning of his sermon, an appalling storm broke out. The earth shook, the sun was darkened, and there was so much thunder and lightning that all were very much afraid. Even greater was their fear when, looking at a picture of Our Lady exposed in a prominent place, they saw her raise her arms to heaven three times to call down God's vengeance upon them if they failed to be converted, to amend their lives and seek the protection of the Holy Mother of God. God wished, by means of these supernatural phenomena, to
to spread the new devotion of the Holy Rosary and to make it more widely known. At last, at the prayer of St. Dominic, the storm came to an end, and he went on preaching. So fervently and compellingly did he explain the importance and value of the rosary that almost all the people of Toulouse embraced it and renounced their false beliefs. In a very short time, a great improvement was seen in the town. People began leading Christian lives and gave up their former bad habits. Third Rose The miraculous way in which the devotion to the Holy Rosary was established is something of a parallel to the way in which God gave His law to the world on Mount Sinai, and it obviously proves its value and importance. Inspired by the Holy Spirit, instructed by the Blessed Virgin as well as by his own experience, St. Dominic preached the Rosary for the rest of his life. He preached it by his example as well as by his sermons, in cities and in country places, to people of high station and low, before scholars and the uneducated, to Catholics and to heretics. The rosary, which he said every day, was his preparation for every sermon and his little tryst with Our Lady immediately after preaching. One day he had to preach at Notre Dame in Paris, and it happened to be the feast of St. John the Evangelist. He was in a little chapel behind the high altar, prayerfully preparing his sermon by saying the rosary, as he always did, when Our Lady appeared to him and said, Dominic, even though what you have planned to say may be very good, I am bringing you a much better sermon. St. Dominic took in his hands the book Our Lady preferred, read the sermon carefully, and when he had understood it and meditated on it, he gave thanks to her. When the time came, he went up into the pulpit, and in spite of the feast day, made no mention of St. John, other than to say that he had been found worthy to be the guardian of the Queen of Heaven. The congregation was made up of theologians and other eminent people who were used to hearing unusual and polished discourses, but St. Dominic told them that it was not his desire to give them a learned discourse, wise in the eyes of the world, but that he would speak in the simplicity of the Holy Spirit and with his forcefulness. So he began preaching the rosary and explained the Hail Mary word by word as he would to a group of children and used the very simple illustrations which were in the book given him by Our Lady. Cartagena, the great scholar, quoting Blessed Alan de la Roche in De Dignitatis Alteri, describes how this took place. Blessed Alan writes that one day Father Dominic said to him in a vision, My son, it is good to preach, but there is always a danger of looking for praise rather than the salvation of souls. Listen carefully to what happened to me in Paris, so that you may be on your guard against this kind of mistake. I was to preach in the great church dedicated to the Blessed Virgin, and I was particularly anxious to give a fine sermon, not out of pride, but because of the high intellectual stature of the congregation. An hour before the time I had to preach, I was dutifully saying my rosary, as I always did before giving a sermon, when I fell into ecstasy. I saw my beloved friend, the Mother of God, coming towards me with a book in her hand. Dominic, she said, your sermon for today may be very good indeed, but no matter how good it is, I have brought you one that is very much better. Of course I was overjoyed, and I took the book and read every word of it. Just as Our Lady had said, I found exactly the right things to say in my sermon, so I thanked her with all my heart. When it was time to begin, I saw that the University of Paris had turned out in full force, as well as a large number of noblemen. They had all seen and heard of the great things that the good Lord had been doing through me. I went up into the pulpit. It was the feast of St. John the Evangelist, but all I said about him was that he had been found worthy to be the guardian of the Queen of Heaven. Then I addressed the congregation. My lords and illustrious doctors of the University, you are accustomed to hearing learned sermons suited to your refined tastes. Now I do not want to speak to you in the scholarly language of human wisdom, but on the contrary, to show you the Spirit of God and His greatness. Here ends the quotation from Blessed Alan, after which Cartagena goes on to say in his own words, Then St. Dominic explained the angelic salutation to them, using simple comparisons and examples from everyday life. Blessed Alan, according to Cartagena, mentioned several other occasions when Our Lord and Our Lady appeared to St. Dominic to urge him and inspire him to preach the rosary more and more in order to wipe out sin and convert sinners and heretics. In another passage, Cartagena says, Blessed Alan said Our Lady revealed to him that after she had appeared to St. Dominic, her blessed son appeared to him and said, Dominic, 
I rejoice to see that you are not relying on your own wisdom, and that, rather than seek the empty praise of men, you are working with great humility for the salvation of souls. But many priests want to preach thunderously against the worst kinds of sin at the very outset, failing to realize that before a sick person is given bitter medicine, he needs to be prepared by being put into the right frame of mind to really benefit by it. That is why, before doing anything else, priests should try to kindle a love of prayer in people's hearts, and especially a love of my angelic psalter. If only they would all start saying it, and would really persevere, God in His mercy could hardly refuse to give them His grace. So I want you to preach my rosary. In another place, Blessed Allen says, All priests say a Hail Mary with the faithful before preaching, to ask for God's grace. They do this because of a revelation that St. Dominic had from Our Lady. My son, she said one day, do not be surprised that your sermons fail to bear the results you had hoped for. You are trying to cultivate a piece of ground which has not had any rain. Now when God planned to renew the face of the earth, he started by sending down rain from heaven. And this was the angelic salutation. In this way God reformed the world. So when you give a sermon, urge people to say my rosary, and in this way your words will bear much fruit for souls. St. Dominic lost no time in obeying, and from then on he exerted great influence by his sermons. This last quotation is from the Book of Miracles of the Holy Rosary, written in Italian, also found in Justin's works, Sermon 143. I have been very pleased to quote these well-known authors word for word for the benefit of those who might otherwise have doubts as to the marvelous power of the Rosary. As long as priests followed St. Dominic's example and preached devotion to the Holy Rosary, Piety and fervor thrived throughout the Christian world and in those religious orders which were devoted to the rosary. But since people have neglected this gift from heaven, all kinds of sin and disorder have spread far and wide. Fourth Rose All things, even the holiest, are subject to change, especially when they are dependent on man's free will. It is hardly to be wondered at, then, that the confraternity of the Holy Rosary only retained its first fervor for a century after it was instituted by St. Dominic. After this, it was like a thing buried and forgotten. Doubtless, too, the wicked scheming and jealousy of the devil were largely responsible for getting people to neglect the Rosary, and thus block the flow of God's grace which it had drawn upon the world. Thus, in 1349, God punished the whole of Europe with the most terrible plague that had ever been known. Starting in the East, it spread throughout Italy, Germany, France, Poland, and Hungary, bringing desolation wherever it went, for out of a hundred men, hardly one lived to tell the tale. Big cities, towns, villages, and monasteries were almost completely deserted during the three years that the epidemic lasted. This scourge of God was quickly followed by two others the heresy of the flagellants, and a tragic schism in 1376. Later on, when these trials were over, thanks to the mercy of God, Our Lady told Blessed Allen to revive the former confraternity of the Holy Rosary. Blessed Allen was one of the Dominican fathers at the monastery at Dinan in Brittany. He was an eminent theologian and a famous preacher. Our Lady chose him because, since the confraternity had originally been started in that province, it was fitting that a Dominican from the same province should have the honor of re-establishing it. Blessed Allen began this great work in 1460, after a special warning from our Lord. This is how he received that urgent message, as he himself tells it. One day when he was offering Mass, our Lord, who wished to spur him on to preach the Holy Rosary, spoke to him in the Sacred Host. How can you crucify me again so soon, Jesus said. What did you say, Lord? asked Blessed Alan, horrified. You crucified me once before by your sins, answered Jesus, and I would willingly be crucified again rather than have my father offended by the sins you used to commit. You are crucifying me again now because you have all the learning and understanding that you need to preach my mother's rosary, and you are not doing it. If you only did that, you could teach many souls the right path and lead them away from sin. But you are not doing it, and so you yourself are guilty of the sins that they commit. This terrible reproach made Blessed Allen solemnly resolve to preach the rosary unceasingly. Our Lady also said to him one day to inspire him to preach the rosary more and more, 
You were a great sinner in your youth, but I obtained the grace of your conversion from my son. Had such a thing been possible, I would have liked to have gone through all kinds of suffering to save you, because converted sinners are a glory to me. And I would have done that also to make you worthy of preaching my rosary far and wide. St. Dominic appeared to Blessed Alan as well, and told him of the great results of his ministry. He had preached the rosary unceasingly. His sermons had borne great fruit, and many people had been converted during his missions. He said to Blessed Alan, See what wonderful results I have had through preaching the rosary. You and all who love Our Lady ought to do the same so that, by means of this holy practice of the rosary, you may draw all people to the real science of the virtues. Briefly, then, this is the history of how St. Dominic established the Holy Rosary and of how Blessed Alan de la Roche restored it. Fifth Rose Strictly speaking, there can be only one kind of confraternity of the rosary, that is, one whose members agree to say the entire rosary of 150 Hail Marys every day. However, considering the fervor of those who say it, we may distinguish three kinds. Ordinary membership, which entails saying the complete rosary once a week. Perpetual membership, which requires it to be said only once a year. Daily membership, which obliges one to say it all every day, that is, the fifteen decades made up of 150 Hail Marys. None of these oblige under pain of sin. It is not even a venial sin to fail in this duty, because such an undertaking is entirely voluntary and supererogatory. Needless to say, people should not join the confraternity if they do not intend to fulfill their obligation by saying the rosary as often as is required, without, however, neglecting the duties of their state in life. So whenever the rosary clashes with the duty of one's state in life, holy as the rosary is, one must give preference to the duty to be performed. Similarly, sick people are not obliged to say the whole rosary, or even part of it, if this effort might tire them and make them worse. If you have been unable to say it because of some duty required by obedience, or because you genuinely forgot, or because of some urgent necessity, you have not committed even a venial sin. You will then receive the benefits of the confraternity just the same, sharing in the graces and merits of your brothers and sisters in the rosary who are saying it throughout the world. And, my dear Catholic people, even if you fail to say your rosary out of sheer carelessness or laziness, as long as you do not have any formal contempt for it, you do not sin, absolutely speaking, but you forfeit your participation in the prayers, good works, and merits of the confraternity. Moreover, because you have not been faithful in things that are little and of supererogation, almost without knowing it, you may fall into the habit of neglecting big things, such as those duties which bind under pain of sin. For he that scorns small things shall fall little by little. Sixth Rose From the time St. Dominic established the devotion to the Holy Rosary, up to the time when Blessed Alain de la Roche re-established it in 1460, it has always been called the Psalter of Jesus and Mary. This is because it has the same number of Hail Marys as there are Psalms in the Book of the Psalms of David. Since simple and uneducated people are not able to say the Psalms of David, the Rosary is held to be just as fruitful for them as David's Psalter is for others. But the Rosary can be considered to be even more valuable than the latter for three reasons. 1. Firstly, because the angelic Psalter bears a nobler fruit, that of the Word Incarnate, whereas David's Psalter only prophesies his coming. 2. Just as the real thing is more important than its prefiguration, and the body surpasses the shadow, so the Psalter of Our Lady is greater than David's Psalter, which did no more than prefigure it. 3. Because Our Lady's Psalter, or the Rosary, made up of the Our Father and Hail Mary, is the direct work of the Blessed Trinity. Here is what the learned Cartagena says about it. The scholarly writer of Aix la Chapelle says in his book, The Rose Crown, dedicated to the Emperor Maximilian, It cannot be maintained that salutation of Mary is a recent innovation. It spread almost with the Church itself. For at the very beginnings of the Church, the more educated members of the faithful celebrated the praises of God in the 150 Psalms of David. The ordinary people who encountered more difficulty in divine service thus conceived a holy emulation of them. They considered, which is indeed true, that the heavenly praises of the Rosary contained all the divine secrets for the Psalms, 
For if the psalms sing of the one who is to come, the rosary proclaims him as having come. That is how they began to call their prayer of 150 salutations the Psalter of Mary, and to proceed each decade with an Our Father, as was done by those who recited the psalms. The Psalter, or Rosary, of Our Lady is divided into three chaplets of five decades each for the following reasons. 1. To honor the three persons of the Blessed Trinity. 2. To honor the life, death, and glory of Jesus Christ. 3. To imitate the Church triumphant, to help the members of the Church militant, and to bring relief to the Church suffering. 4. To imitate the three groups into which the Psalms are divided, the first being for the purgative life, the second for the illuminative life, and the third for the unitive life. 5. To give us graces in abundance during life, peace at death, and glory in eternity. Seventh Rose Ever since Blessed Alan de la Roche re-established this devotion, the voice of the people, which is the voice of God, gave it the name of the Rosary, which means Crown of Roses. That is to say, that every time people say the Rosary devoutly, they place on the heads of Jesus and Mary 153 white roses and 16 red roses. Being heavenly flowers, these roses will never fade or lose their beauty. Our Lady has approved and confirmed this name of the Rosary. She has revealed to several people that each time they say a Hail Mary, they are giving her a beautiful rose, and that each complete rosary makes her a crown of roses. The Jesuit brother, Alfonsus Rodriguez, used to say his rosary with such fervor that he often saw a red rose come out of his mouth at each Our Father, and a white rose at each Hail Mary, both equal in beauty and differing only in color. The Chronicles of St. Francis tell of a young friar who had the praiseworthy habit of saying this crown of Our Lady every day before dinner. One day, for some reason or other, he did not manage to say it. The refectory bell had already been rung when he asked the superior to allow him to say it before coming to the table, and having obtained permission, he withdrew to his cell to pray. After he had been gone a long time, the superior sent another friar to fetch him, and he found him in his room, bathed in a heavenly light, in the presence of Our Lady and two angels. Beautiful roses kept issuing from his mouth at each Hail Mary, and the two angels were taking them one by one and placing them on Our Lady's head, while she smilingly accepted them. Finally, two other friars who had been sent to find out what had happened to the first two saw the same scene, and Our Lady did not leave until the whole rosary had been said. So the complete rosary is a large crown of roses, and each chaplet of five decades is a little wreath of flowers, or a little crown of heavenly roses, which we place on the heads of Jesus and Mary. The rose is the queen of flowers, and so the rosary is the rose of devotions, and the most important one. Eighth Rose it is scarcely possible for me to put into words how Our Lady esteems the Rosary and how she prefers it to all other devotions. Nor can I sufficiently express how wonderfully she rewards those who work to make known the devotion, to establish it and spread it, nor, on the other hand, how strictly she punishes those who work against it. St. Dominic had nothing more at heart during his life than to praise Our Lady, to preach her greatness, and to inspire everybody to honor her by saying her Rosary. As a reward, he received countless graces from her. This powerful Queen of Heaven crowned his labors with many miracles and prodigies. God always granted him what he asked through Our Lady. The greatest favor of all was that she helped him to crush the Albigensian heresy and made him the founder and patriarch of a great religious order. As for Blessed Alan de la Roche, who restored the devotion of the Rosary, he received many privileges from Our Lady. She graciously appeared to him several times to teach him how to work out his salvation, to become a good priest and perfect religious, and how to pattern himself on our Lord. He used to be horribly tempted and persecuted by devils, and then a deep sadness would fall upon him, and sometimes he would be near to despair. But Our Lady always comforted him by her presence, which banished the clouds of darkness from his soul. She taught him how to say the rosary, explaining its value and the fruits to be gained by it and she gave him a great and glorious privilege, which was the honor of being called her new spouse. As a token of her chaste love for him, she placed a ring upon his finger, and a necklace made of her own hair about his neck, 
and gave him a rosary. Father Tritem, the learned Cartagena and Martin of Navarre, as well as others, have spoken of him in terms of highest praise. Blessed Allen died at Zwoll in Flanders on September 8, 1475, after having brought more than a hundred thousand people into the confraternity. Blessed Thomas of St. John was well known for his sermons on the Holy Rosary, and the devil, jealous of his success, tortured him so much that he fell ill and was sick for such a long time that the doctors gave him up. One night, when he really thought he was dying, the devil appeared to him in the most terrible form imaginable. There was a picture of Our Lady near his bed. He looked at it and cried with all his heart and soul and strength, Help me, save me, my dearest mother. No sooner had he said this than the picture seemed to come alive, and Our Lady put out her hand, took him by the arm, and said, Do not be afraid, Thomas, my son. Here I am, and I am going to save you. Get up now and go on preaching my rosary as you used to do. I promise to shield you from your enemies. When Our Lady said this, the devil fled, and blessed Thomas got up, finding himself in perfect health. He then thanked Our Lady with tears of joy. He resumed his rosary apostolate, and his sermons were wonderfully successful. Our Lady not only blesses those who preach her rosary, but she highly rewards all those who, by their example, get others to say it. Alphonsus, king of Leon and Galicia, very much wanted all his servants to honor the Blessed Virgin by saying the rosary, so he used to hang a large rosary on his belt, though he never said it himself. Nevertheless, his wearing it encouraged his courtiers to say the rosary devoutly. One day, the king fell seriously ill, and when he was given up for dead, he found himself in spirit before the judgment seat of our Lord. Many devils were there accusing him of all the sins he had committed, and our Lord was about to condemn him when Our Lady came forward to speak in his favor. She called for a pair of scales and had his sins placed in one of the balances while she put the large rosary which he had always worn on the other scale, together with all the rosaries that had been said through his example. It was found that the rosaries weighed more than his sins. Looking at him with great kindness, Our Lady said, As a reward for the little service you did for me in wearing my rosary, I have obtained a great grace for you from my son. Your life will be spared for a few more years. See that you spend those years wisely and do penance. When the king regained consciousness, he cried out, Blessed be the rosary of the most holy Virgin Mary, by which I have been delivered from eternal damnation. After he had recovered his health, he spent the rest of his life in spreading devotion to the rosary, and said it faithfully every day. People who love the Blessed Virgin ought to follow the example of King Alphonsus and that of the saints whom I have mentioned, so that they too may win other souls for the confraternity of the Holy Rosary. They will receive great graces here on earth and finally eternal life. Those who explain me will have life everlasting. Ninth Rose It is very wicked indeed and unjust to hinder the progress of the confraternity of the Holy Rosary. God has severely punished many of those who have been so benighted as to scorn the confraternity and have sought to destroy it. Even though God has set his seal of approval on the rosary by many miracles, and though it has been approved by the church in many papal bulls, there are only too many people who are against the holy rosary today. Such are free thinkers and those who scorn religion, who either condemn the rosary or try to turn others away from it. It is easy to see that they have absorbed the poison of hell and that they are inspired by the devil. For no one can condemn devotion to the Holy Rosary without condemning all that is most holy in the Catholic faith, such as the Lord's Prayer, the Hail Mary, and the mysteries of the life, death, and glory of Jesus Christ and His Holy Mother. These free thinkers who cannot bear to have people saying the Rosary often fall into an heretical state of mind without realizing it, and come to hate the rosary and its mysteries. To have a loathing for confraternities is to fall away from God and true piety, for our Lord himself has told us that he is always in the midst of those who are gathered together in his name. No good Catholic would neglect the many great indulgences which the Church has granted to confraternities. Finally, to dissuade others from joining the rosary confraternity is to be an enemy of souls, because the rosary is a means of avoiding sin and leading a good life. 
Saint Bonaventure says in his Psalter that whoever neglects Our Lady will die in his sins. What then must be the punishment in store for those who turn people away from devotion to her? Tenth Rose. While Saint Dominic was preaching the Rosary in Carcassonne, a heretic made fun of his miracles and the fifteen mysteries of the Rosary, and this prevented other heretics from being converted. As a punishment, God allowed fifteen thousand devils to enter the man's body. His parents took him to Father Dominic to be delivered from the evil spirits. He started to pray, and he begged everyone who was there to say the Rosary out loud with him. And at each Hail Mary, Our Lady drove a hundred devils out of the man, and they came out in the form of red-hot coals. After he had been delivered, he abjured his former errors, was converted, and joined the Rosary Confraternity. Several of his associates did the same, having been greatly moved by his punishment and by the power of the Rosary. The learned Franciscan Cartagena, as well as several other authors, says that an extraordinary event took place in 1482. The venerable Father James Springer and the religious of his order were zealously working to re-establish devotion to the Rosary and its confraternity in the city of Cologne. Unfortunately, two priests who were famous for their preaching ability were jealous of the great influence they were exerting through preaching the Rosary. These two fathers spoke against this devotion whenever they had a chance, and as they were very eloquent and had a great reputation, they persuaded many people not to join the confraternity. One of them, the better to achieve his wicked end, wrote a special sermon against the Rosary and planned to give it the following Sunday. But when the time came for the sermon, he did not appear, and after a certain amount of waiting, someone went to fetch him. He was found to be dead, and he had evidently died without anyone to help him. After persuading himself that this death was due to natural causes, the other priest decided to carry out his friend's plan and give a similar sermon on another day, hoping to put an end to the confraternity of the Rosary. However, when the day came for him to preach and it was time to give the sermon, God punished him by striking him down with paralysis, which deprived him of the use of his limbs and of his power of speech. At last, he admitted his fault and that of his friend, and in his heart he silently besought Our Lady to help him. He promised that if only she would cure him, he would preach the Rosary with as much zeal as that with which he had formerly fought against it. For this end, he implored her to restore his health and his speech, which she did. And finding himself instantaneously cured, he rose up like another Saul, a persecutor turned defender of the Holy Rosary. He publicly acknowledged his former error, and ever afterwards preached the wonders of the Rosary with great zeal and eloquence. I am quite sure that free thinkers and ultra-critical people of today will question the truth of the stories in this little book, as they question most things. But all I have done has been to copy them from very good contemporary authors. And in part from a book written a short time ago, *The Mystical Rosary* by Father Antonin Thomas, O.P. Everyone knows that there are three different kinds of faith by which we believe different kinds of stories. To stories from Holy Scripture, we owe divine faith. To stories on non-religious subjects, which are not against common sense and are written by trustworthy authors, we pay the tribute of human faith. And to stories about holy subjects, which are told by good authors. And are not in any way contrary to reason, to faith, or to morals, even though they may sometimes deal with happenings which are above the ordinary. We pay the tribute of a pious faith. I agree that we must be neither too credulous nor too critical, and that we should keep a happy medium in all things in order to find just where truth and virtue lie. But on the other hand, I know equally well that charity easily leads us to believe all that is not contrary to faith or morals. Charity believes all things, in the same way as pride induces us to doubt even well-authenticated stories, on the plea that they are not to be found in Holy Scripture. This is one of the devil's traps. Heretics of the past who deny tradition have fallen into it, and overcritical people of today are falling into it too, without even realizing it. People of this kind refuse to believe what they do not understand or what is not to their liking, simply because of their own spirit of pride and independence. Second decade, the surpassing merit of the Rosary as seen in the prayers which compose it. Eleventh rose, the Creed. 
The creed, or the symbol of the apostles, which is set on the crucifix of the rosary, is a holy summary of all the Christian truths. It is a prayer that has great merit, because faith is the root, foundation, and beginning of all Christian virtues, of all eternal virtues, and of all prayers that are pleasing to God. Anyone who comes to God must believe, and the greater his faith, the more merit his prayer will have, the more powerful it will be, and the more it will glorify God. I shall not take time here to explain the creed word for word, but I cannot resist saying that the first words, I believe in God, are wonderfully effective as a means of sanctifying our souls and putting the devils to rout, because these words contain the acts of the three theological virtues of faith, hope, and charity. It was by saying these words that many saints overcame temptations, especially those against faith, hope, or charity, either during their lifetime or at the hour of their death. They were also the last words of St. Peter, martyr. A heretic had cleft his head in two by a blow of his sword, and although St. Peter was at his last gasp, he managed to trace these words in the sand with his finger. The Holy Rosary contains many mysteries of Jesus and Mary, and since faith is the only key which opens up these mysteries for us, we must begin the Rosary by saying the Creed very devoutly, and the stronger our faith, the more merit our Rosary will have. This faith must be lively and informed by charity. In other words, to recite the Rosary properly, it is necessary to be in God's grace, or at least seeking it. This faith must be strong and constant, that is, one must not be looking for sensible devotion and spiritual consolation in the recitation of the rosary, nor should one give it up because the mind is flooded with countless involuntary distractions, or because one experiences a strange distaste in the soul, or an almost continual and oppressive fatigue of the body. Neither feelings, nor consolation, nor sighs, nor transports, nor the continual attention of the imagination are needed. Faith and good intentions are quite enough. Sola fide sufficit. Twelfth Rose, the Our Father. The Our Father, or the Lord's Prayer, derives its great value above all from its author, who is neither a man nor an angel, but the King of angels and of men, our Lord Jesus Christ. St. Cyprian says it was necessary that he who came to give us the life of grace as our Savior should teach us the way to pray as our Heavenly Master. The beautiful order, the tender forcefulness and the clarity of this divine prayer pay tribute to our divine Master's wisdom. It is a very short prayer, but can teach us so very much, and it is well within the grasp of uneducated people, while scholars find it a continual source of investigation into the mysteries of God. The Our Father contains all the duties we owe to God, the acts of all the virtues and the petitions for all our spiritual and corporal needs. Tertullian says that the Our Father is a summary of the New Testament. Thomas a Kempis says that it surpasses all the desires of all the saints, that it is a condensation of all the beautiful sayings of all the psalms and canticles, that in it we ask God for everything that we need, that by it we praise Him in the very best way, that by it we lift up our souls from earth to heaven and unite them closely to God. St. John Chrysostom says that we cannot be our master's disciples unless we pray as he did and in the way that he showed us. Moreover, God the Father listens more willingly to the prayer that we have learned from his Son rather than those of our own making, which have all our human limitations. We should say the Our Father with the certitude that the Eternal Father will hear us, because it is the prayer of his Son, whom he always hears, and because we are his members. God will surely grant our petitions made through the Lord's Prayer because it is impossible to imagine that such a good father could refuse a request couched in the language of so worthy a son, reinforced by his merits, and made at his behest. St. Augustine assures us that whenever we say the Our Father devoutly, our venial sins are forgiven. The just man falls seven times, and in the Lord's Prayer he will find seven petitions which will both help him to avoid lapses and protect him from his spiritual enemies. Our Lord, knowing how weak and helpless we are, and how many difficulties we endure, made his prayer short and easy to say, so that if we say it devoutly and often, we can be sure that God will quickly come to our aid. 
I have a word for you, devout souls who pay little attention to the prayer that the Son of God gave us himself and asked us all to say. It is high time for you to change your way of thinking. You only esteem prayers that men have written, as though anybody, even the most inspired man in the whole world, could possibly know more about how we ought to pray than Jesus Christ himself. You look for prayers in books written by other men almost as though you were ashamed of saying the prayer that our Lord told us to say. You have managed to convince yourself that the prayers in those books are for scholars and for the rich, and that the rosary is only for women and children and the poor people, as if the prayers and praises you have been reading were more beautiful and more pleasing to God than those which are to be found in the Lord's Prayer. It is a very dangerous temptation to lose interest in the prayer that our Lord gave us and to take up prayers that men have written instead. Not that I disapprove of prayers that saints have written to encourage the faithful to praise God, but it is not to be endured that they should prefer these to the prayer which was uttered by wisdom incarnate. If they ignore this prayer, it is as though they passed by the spring to go to the brook, and refusing the clear water, they drink instead that which is dirty. For the rosary made up of the Lord's Prayer and the Hail Mary is this clear and ever-flowing water which comes from the fountain of grace, whereas other prayers, which they look for in books, are nothing but tiny streams which spring from this fountain. People who say the Lord's Prayer carefully, weighing every word and meditating on them, may indeed call themselves blessed, for they find therein everything that they need or can wish for. When we say this wonderful prayer, we touch God's heart at the very outset by calling Him by that sweet name of Father. Our Father, He is the dearest of fathers, all-powerful in His creation, wonderful in the way He maintains the world, completely lovable in His divine providence, all good and infinitely so in the redemption. We have God for our Father, so we are all brothers, and heaven is our homeland and our heritage. This should be more than enough to teach us to love God and our neighbor and to be detached from the things of this world. So we ought to love our Heavenly Father and say to Him over and over again, Our Father, who art in heaven, Thou who dost fill heaven and earth with the immensity of Thy being, Thou who art present everywhere, Thou who art in the saints by Thy glory, in the damned by Thy justice, in the good by Thy grace, in sinners by the patience with which Thou dost tolerate them, Grant that we may always remember that we come from Thee. Grant that we may live as Thy true children, that we may direct our course towards Thee alone with all the ardor of our soul. Hallowed be Thy name. The name of the Lord is holy and to be feared, said the prophet King David, and heaven, according to Isaiah, echoes with the praises of the seraphim who unceasingly praise the holiness of the Lord God of hosts. We ask here that all the world may learn to know and adore the attributes of our God, who is so great and so holy. We ask that he may be known, loved, and adored by pagans, Turks, Jews, barbarians, and all infidels, that all men may serve and glorify him by a living faith, a staunch hope, a burning charity, and by the renouncing of all erroneous beliefs. In short, we pray that all men may be holy, because our God himself is holy. Thy kingdom come. That is to say, may you reign in our souls by your grace during life, so that after death we may be found worthy to reign with thee in thy kingdom in perfect and unending bliss. That we firmly believe in this happiness to come. We hope for it and we expect it, because God the Father has promised it in his great goodness, and because it was purchased for us by the merits of God the Son and it has been made known to us by the light of the Holy Spirit. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. As Tertullian says, this sentence does not mean in the least that we are afraid of people thwarting God's designs, because nothing whatsoever can happen without divine providence having foreseen it and having made it fit into his plans beforehand. No obstruction in the whole world can possibly prevent the will of God from being carried out. Rather. When we say these words, we ask God to make us humbly resigned to all that he has seen fit to send us in this life. We also ask him to help us to do in all things and at all times his holy will, made known to us by the commandments, promptly, lovingly, and faithfully, as the angels and the blessed do in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. 
Our Lord teaches us to ask God for everything that we need, whether in the spiritual or the temporal order. By asking for our daily bread, we humbly admit our own poverty and insufficiency and pay tribute to our God, knowing that all temporal goods come from His providence. When we say bread, we ask for that which is necessary to live, and of course, that does not include luxuries. We ask for this bread today, which means that we are concerned only for the present, leaving the morrow in the hands of providence. And when we ask for our daily bread, we recognize that we need God's help every day, and that we are entirely dependent upon Him for His help and protection. Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Every sin, says St. Augustine and Tertullian, is a debt which we contract with God, and He in His justice requires payment down to the last farthing. Unfortunately, we all have these sad debts. No matter how many they may be, we should go to God with all confidence and with true sorrow for our sins, saying, Our Father who art in heaven, forgive us our sins of thought and those of speech. Forgive us our sins of commission and of omission, which make us infinitely guilty in the eyes of thy justice. We dare to ask this because thou art our loving and merciful Father, and because we have forgiven those who have offended us, out of obedience to you and out of charity. Do not permit us, in spite of our infidelity to thy graces, to give in to the temptations of the world, the devil, and the flesh. But deliver us from evil, the evil of sin, from the evil of temporal punishment and of everlasting punishment, which we have rightly deserved. Amen. This word at the end of the Our Father is very consoling, and St. Jerome says that it is a sort of seal of approbation that God puts at the end of our petitions to assure us that He will grant our requests, as though He Himself were answering, Amen, may it be as you have asked, for truly you have obtained what was asked for. That is what is meant by this word, Amen.